Hi everyone, my name is Katherine Reese. I'm commonly called Katie. I am the clinical educator for respiratory therapy and respiratory practices in the ICU area at SickKids. And today I am here to present how we approach acute non-invasive ventilation in pediatrics. So we'll start by saying that uh, I don't have any conflict of interest, um, that SickKids or myself does not endorse any set brand or device for non-invasive use, and that any pictures of devices or uh, masks are only examples of equipment that potentially can be used in pediatrics. So what we are going to talk today about is some of the equipment options that are available in pediatrics, including, including how we manage the entire size range that we see. Um, we will highlight some of the common challenges we have with non-invasive ventilation in pediatrics, and we'll try to offer a general approach and support um, uh, to how we titrate our settings and manage non-invasive uh, when it's used for acute reasons. So the starting point for this whole conversation has to be that acute non-invasive ventilation when used in pediatrics means that patient is critically ill. And so it's important that we always make sure before we're going down these um, pathways to suggest and start initiating non-invasive ventilation that we have used all of our normal supports and consults um, to the associated medical professionals and medical teams that will be involved um, with these patients. In our institution, we only provide acute non-invasive ventilation in our ICU environments and the emergency department, um, assuming that these patients are in fully monitored environments. And when we say fully monitored, we mean with eyes on care with the um, healthcare providers that are involved in managing the non-invasive. Uh, we will make sure that they have full monitoring, including ECG saturation and frequent blood pressure measurements. Um, and we will also make sure that there's any necessary equipment uh, for resuscitation nearby. So these patients will be in acute respiratory distress, and there's always a chance that you may need to escalate therapy, and therefore you should have these resources available to you. Uh, the other things to think about and consider is certainly the family and caregivers. This will be a very stressful and acute um, situation, and so we always make sure that they are aware of what's going on, and we will let them be present for the initiation of non-invasive if they wish to be in the room and, and there, and they can sometimes even support by helping to hold hands or comfort the children. Um, the final thing that I will say also is just remember that non-invasive is supportive only. Um, so we always ask that we're thinking about the underlying medical um, pathology that is ongoing or pathophysiology and that we make sure that we have treated that appropriately um, because this will not relieve all sorts of respiratory distress. So I'll start by saying in terms of devices that can provide non-invasive support, there's a wide variety of options out there. Um, there can be sometimes single limb devices as well as dual limb devices that provide non-invasive support and both work within the pediatric size and range. You really need to know your device and equipment in terms of the specifications and sizes that it can be used on. So there are single limb devices that are generally thought of as adult devices that potentially could be used on old, older children. Um, and adolescents. There are other single limb devices that have a much wider size range that can go down to really infant sizes. And then there's quite a few different transport ventilators or critical care ventilators that now have non-invasive software and can also provide non-invasive support to your patients. Depending on the device, they sometimes define them with overlapping age ranges or weight ranges. And so sometimes this can be potentially confusing or other devices may um, define their, their support based on tidal volume range size that they can provide. And really what we re recommend is that you work with your clinical support specialists or um, the device specialists um, to make sure that you have all of the understanding of what the different options are on the ventilator, including the ancillary equipment like the circuit size that you would need um, to use the device for PD. Pediatrics. And once you have a sense of the device and the equipment that is necessary and an understanding of how the device works, you can then think about how you will implement this for your clinical practice. So we have tried to create references for our staff with very clear 
size ranges. And we sometimes even simplified if there are overlapping ranges of how you can use a ventilator, what the practice will be at your institution. Um, so we suggest that you do this because it can be very stressful to initiate non-invasive um, for pediatric patients. And so this helps to reduce your cognitive load. It helps to make the use of the equipment a little more straightforward. And you might even start to consider it, the differences in the dead space and the ranges that are provided to you and try to optimize this as much as possible for the patients. So you might have seen that reference for uh, the one ventilator that we sometimes use for non-invasive ventilation. Uh, but know that at SickKids we use both single limb systems as well as dual limb systems um, with both adult and neonatal circuit sizes uh, to provide non-invasive ventilation. Right now, in terms of disposable circuits, there's not a pediatric size circuit that we use. So we use the neonatal size circuit um, up to around 20 kilos or the tidal volume range that is recommended by the manufacturer. Um, and then we would switch to the adult size circuit for the older children. It's important to remember that um, single limb systems have to have an intentional leak and therefore it's important to make sure that your interfaces will connect with the equipment appropriately. So a single limb system may have an exhalation port that has a purposeful fixed leak in it um, as well as the mask often has a purposeful fixed leak in it as well um, to allow fresh gas to always be provided to the non-invasive interface. Uh, whereas dual limb systems often these masks don't have any sort of leak with the intention that all of the gas flow from the ventilator will go into the mask and then be returned to the ventilator through the expiratory limb of the circuit. Um, so it's really important that when you're using a dual limb system for non-invasive that you aren't using a mask that contains a leak um, because that will present with a lot of challenges and often uh, the device potentially alarms or you'll have real challenges with sensing patients. Um, in terms of one of the major challenges that we have in pediatrics is really finding interfaces that work well um, and that fit across the wide range of things. So um, this is our guesstimate of where the mask ranges fit. Each mask may actually provide a range and a specific um, population or, or weight-based range that it recommends for the, the mask. But really at SickKids, what we do is um, we size the equipment based on the size of the patient and how the, the interface actually fits the patient. So in terms of options, you may actually get away with um, neonatal interfaces that would be normally used in an NICU for some of your smallest patients. Um, you then have nasal interfaces that can work with our smaller pediatric sizes and these are pediatric specific nasal interfaces here and once you get into the larger children um, probably somewhere around the age of four or six um, would be when they potentially can start fitting adult size, petite size, or extra small sizes of masks to provide non-invasive support. If you're looking for an interface that's going to cover both the mouth and the nose because you need to provide that acute level support um, and you want to make sure that the triggering or sensitivity is as optimized as possible and there's no leak through the mouth, um, you, we often go to a total face mask for our smallest patients just because trying to size a nasal and uh, mouth interface um, is really difficult but there also aren't a lot of options in this size range uh, to potentially do that um, and then we often will switch as the child gets to be older again that kind of four to six or uh, eight year old range we would then switch to what we call a full face mask which is a mouth and nose um, traditional style that you may see more commonly in adults so other than the the mask challenges that we have, we also have a lot of challenges in terms of synchrony for our smallest patients. Um, so a lot of devices are improving their leak um, algorithms or their sensitivity of the ventilator to uh, sense patient efforts and provide synchronous non-invasive support. Um, but I'm going to give you this example just to kind of appreciate how difficult or challenging it can be for devices to do this. Um, so on single limb devices, you commonly have a fixed leak of somewhere between 20 to 35 liters a minute. Um, that sometimes can be slightly variable depending on how your mask is fit. Um, so some of this leak is unintentional leak around an interface but a lot of that leak may be purposeful or fixed based on the device that's in use. Um, 
And so these patients, imagine a five kilo patient with that degree of leak through the interface. We're asking the device to sense a small effort where the tidal volume range may only be 30 mils. Um, and so you can see that that could be very challenging to do software, to do such sensitive um, measurements. Uh, and Often in dual limb systems, they calculate out the leak as a percentage of the tidal volume in terms of what is going from the device and what is returning. And so you can imagine even just that small amount of leak under positive pressure can be a good portion of that 30 mils of tidal volume that you're trying to deliver. So you can often see high leak levels displayed when you're doing non-invasive pediatric ventilation. And it doesn't mean that you need to necessarily tighten that mask. You should assess your fit of your mask, but it's just inherently because of the small size of the breath that you will see larger leaks, especially, um, or larger percentage leaks, especially with dual limb systems if they display the leak that way. And so the way we really address that is going to be through a few different means. So the first way that we can sometimes address non-invasive leak through a single limb system is we actually remove any of the leak that isn't necessary for the device. So instead of having a fixed exhalation port with a leak or exhalation um, uh, spot for leak here, um, the fixed leak in the mass may be more than adequate um, through the device that we can actually get rid of this and therefore reduce the total intentional leak to as minimal as possible while still providing enough fresh gas flow to the patient. Um, on both types of devices, both single limb and dual limb, we adjust the sensitivity to what provides the best synchronous support for the patient if you're doing bi-level uh, therapy. Um, if you're even doing CPAP and bi-level, um, we also pay very much not a lot of attention to the tidal volumes displayed by the devices. Um, we can trend them and we can sometimes use them over longer periods of time to assess how our non-invasive support is provided, um, but it's not uncommon because of these um, large leaks and these small tidal volumes that we're trying to do that the display of the tidal volume isn't particularly accurate um, and therefore we look at worker breathing um, and patient um, for example uh, blood gases and other things to think about how we titrate our bi-level support uh, rather than looking at the tidal volumes and trying to target a specific tidal volume range on non-invasive. Um, the other thing that we always do is we assess our leak um, through our mask or our mask fit. And so if you're having a lot of challenges in terms of non-invasive, in terms of asynchrony and leak, um, then maybe you just don't have the right mask. Um, and it's not uncommon for us to try one or two masks for a patient if the first mask is providing a lot of challenges to us. The one thing that we always ensure is we have some alarms active on the device. So even though we may not necessarily pay attention entirely to the tidal volume range, we still may have a minute volume alarm or a respiratory rate alarm or a circuit disconnect or an apnea set on the device just to allow us to monitor the patient to a certain degree and ensure that the device would alert, or alert us if there is any challenges with providing therapy. The final challenge that I think is really important to just acknowledge at least is that compliance or tolerance can be tough depending on the developmental stage of the child. And so you can imagine a toddler needing non-invasive support who is feeling incredibly unwell um, and there's strangers coming towards them with a mask that now has to be strapped tight on their face. This can be, you know, just really hard to rationalize or um, be compliant with. Um, and developmentally, we shouldn't expect uh, these patients to necessarily be compliant with us. Um, this would be something a lot of adults don't even really like as well. And so we think about different ways that we can address patient comfort. So the first way that we will uh, try to do this with families is we'll engage the parents with the child and have them try to help explain that they have to use it or have the child actually understand from the um, the parent perspective that the parent is supporting that we need to get this mask on as well. Um, for small infants, um, we will always attempt to bundle cares and potentially bundle infants um, in a blanket for comfort after stabilization. We may leave them unbundled to make sure that we can assess everything first. Um, and for kind of your toddlers and children, we may give them their blankets or stuffed animals or any sort of comfort toy that they have or a comfort item that will keep them more comfortable. They can always hold those in their hands or once we get them settled, um, we can give it back to them in bed if they're going to try to have a little rest or whatnot. 
Other ways that sometimes help with getting um, compliance or getting devices on is you may sometimes start your settings lower than what you think you want therapeutically. Um, so for example, you may just start on a CPAP of five to at least get the device on and get your mask fit reasonably well, and then start titrating your settings upwards from there, going to that bi-level support if you want, or titrating up your CPAP if you think. Um, another thing we sometimes look at is um, distension, abdominal distension, or the need to potentially vent the stomach. Um, so it would be very common in our ICU for long-term non-invasive support to have an NG inserted in the patients um, that are older infants and toddlers and children, sometimes an OG for a, a smaller um, neonatal size patient or a younger patient. But generally, um, if they can tolerate, we will have an NG in. Um, keeping in mind that this sometimes may also impact the mask seal around that NG. Um, and the final thing that I think is important to at least acknowledge um, is the patient tolerance and potential risk that they just will not accept that. And so we have had cases where we are trying to initiate non-invasive because we think that's the most optimal support to provide to the patient. Um, but sometimes if they are absolutely not um, going to be compliant with wearing a mask, uh, we may sometimes uh, consider just leaving the patient on high flow nasal cannula if they're already on that therapy or um, if they're not on any therapy before that, maybe we'll try high flow as a lesser degree of support, but kind of that um, balance of, of what the patient can tolerate um, as an option for us. Um, so this goes to speak again to our no, um, high flow options available. And so we always make sure that we try to optimize our high flow support before um, moving towards non-invasive ventilation if the patient's progression allows us to do this. Um, but we always usually do two, around two per kilo for our smallest patients. Um, and this is kind of that less than 12, less than 10 kilo. We will do a, a two per kilo approach. Older than that, um, we will do a range of support um, that generally um, can align with various guidelines that exist um, for non-invasive support. But just make sure that your high flow flow rates are at least optimized, that you're not on really low flow, flow rates saying high flow nasal cannula fails. Um, so in terms of choosing NIV settings and mode, um, we go back to that first kind of slide in terms of thinking about the supports and whatnot. So this should be a collaborative decision with other members of the team or even on, uh, for example, in Ontario with our critical support for assistance and guidance of choosing non-invasive settings. Um, so in terms of options, our settings are general thought process in the absence of knowing any specific patient pathology or patient um, considerations. Um, the way that we kind of think about where these two different modes of support would really work. In terms of um, CPAP, we would probably consider this more for some of our smallest patients. That's really difficult to get synchronous bi-level support um, with these patients. We may do this for patients where the CO2 is more normalized and therefore they just need a bit of positive pressure um, to re-establish FRC or uh, re-recruit any sort of collapsed areas of the lungs or um, address any sort of distress. Um, if there are exclusive oxygenation challenges, then CPAP should be uh, potentially adequate to support the patient. Um, and then other things where um, may influence whether you do CPAP or BiPAP is sometimes the device limitations. You may only have the option to offer CPAP through some devices um, or in a small infant where apnea is the primary concern and this is being initiated for that purpose, then usually CPAP should be adequate for that. In terms of bi-level support, um, this comes in various forms and various mode names and nomenclature on different devices. Um, we would generally think of this for our older children and adolescents um, who are presenting with acute distress. Sometimes that bi-level support provides that little bit of augmented support um, to inspiration to relieve their work of breathing. Um, these guys obviously have a, a lot more in favor of them in terms of the size of the breath that they're taking for good triggering on the devices to be possible. 
possible. Um, any patient size where there is lots of hypercapnia or hypercapnia and oxygenation challenges would favor more the option to do a bi-level support. And any patient with um, significant distress, usually bi-level is considered a higher level therapy than CPAP. Um, and neuromuscular weakness patients in particular, these patients need that augmented support on inspiration to help with their distress or help with their ventilation. And so these patient population uniquely would be um, more favored towards that bi-level support. Um, there is limited use of asynchronous bi-level in pediatrics at our institution, so I can't really comment if that's um, the option and available uh, mode on your device. And then we kind of think of that high level, our high flow nasal cannula as that support really before that CPAP um, support. So it provides potentially some offloading of worker breathing, uh, potentially through uh, dead space washout um, and a very, very small, small level of non-invasive support. But we really don't consider it a form of CPAP. And so if you want CPAP for the patient, we really recommend using a device that can provide CPAP and measure that pressure. So a lot of people ask for an algorithm from SickKids in terms of our acute non-invasive, and we really don't have one. And so um, I've created this as a general thought process of how we think about non-invasive. And I'm gonna start really on this side of the screen uh, for you to, to go work through. And so the first thing that we always think about is first of all, is it appropriate to do non-invasive? And I think it's always important to have that critical thinking and think about this um, because it really is a supportive therapy that really is a new level of therapy compared to something like high flow in terms of safety. And therefore we would think about it very closely um, before moving towards this level of support. Um, so I have a series of questions on the left that you can read through um, to think about, um, but all of these things are generally necessary for non-invasive to be initiated by a respiratory therapist in the community. Uh, and then when you're ready to start, it's important to have that kind of pause and brief time out to think about the patient and how you're going to manage things if things don't go well. Um, so always making sure that you have your entire monitoring on, that you have necessary eyes on care available for immediately after support to stay with the patient. Um, and it will generally take, you know, 15 minutes to 30 minutes for that patient to really kind of uh, acclimatize to the non-invasive and to see where the the patient's tolerance and worker breathing lands after starting non-invasive therapy. Um, we always make sure that the family is aware, of course, um, and um, making sure that you have all the equipment gathered before you start and including potentially an alternate mask if you think the mask sizing isn't the ideal size for you before going. And so once you've done that timeout and thought about all of those things, then you can really move on to initiating non-invasive. And it's really important to have that clear plan in place before initiating. And so in terms of initiating your mode, you will have some guidance on what you are initiating based on some of the stuff that I've described earlier. Um, the CPAP, usually we would initiate somewhere between five and eight for a lot of pediatric patients. That's not to say you can't initiate higher um, or potentially even at four for those ones that you think are really not going to tolerate a mask going um, strapped onto their face with lots of flow. Um, but then you would titrate your settings as soon as you get them on to the optimal support that you want. If you're initiating right off of level. Um, here's a guidance in terms of the ranges that we would start at. Um, so usually the minimum um, IPAP and EPAP or translate in that into whatever settings are on your ventilator. Um, so the inspiratory pressure or peak pressure on non-invasive would at minimum be 10 and usually the the EPAP or expiratory level or baseline pressure that we would have available would be five for these patients. In terms of rates, we don't usually use a lot of high rates for acute non-invasive ventilation. And that's on the assumption that the patient still has a spontaneous drive and will trigger above whatever rate that you have set on the device. Um, in terms of eye time, similarly, we would titrate that to your patient, your smallest patients usually being around 0.5 seconds and your oldest adolescents being more similar to adults, maybe being as long as one second. And so between that um, range, you would start to think of what works for your patient in terms of that eye set eye time. Um, and then 
once you get the patient on, um, you're going to look for a variety of things. So you're going to look for synchrony um, if you're on bi-level and adjust whatever settings, if possible, on the device to optimize the synchrony that is sensing all of the patient's efforts. In terms of titrating your EPAP or your CPAP level or your PEEP level on your non-invasive, depending on what it's called, we would usually titrate that by one. Um, but not, again, not to say you can't titrate it by more if you don't think, um, if you think you need to be, do a bigger jump um, in care to kind of augment or optimize their therapy. And then in terms of your IPAP or pressure control, we would titrate that similarly by one to two, um, depending on the, the level of support. We often or rarely tight your titrate your respiratory rate um, or your eye time unless we're specifically talking about a neuromuscular disease patient. And that particular patient will get specific directions um, from the medical team in terms of guidance on that. Um, from there, there is a few different options to you. Um, so if your CPAP level gets above 10 centimeters of water, that would be where you start to think about, hey, maybe using a bi-level therapy might be more supportive for this patient. Um, or similarly, if you're on bi-level support and it's just incredibly asynchronous and you can't get the device to trigger well, um, and it looks like it's causing potentially more as um, discomfort or asynchrony than benefit to try to do that bi-level, then maybe you would switch back to a, a single level and just provide the, some of that positive pressure that way. Again, that's a bit contextual in terms of what is the CO2 uh, for the patient, and that would be something that would be discussed really with a larger um, team for that. Um, if they absolutely don't tolerate and we've experienced this, then we might go back to a high flow nasal cannula um, simply to minimize agitation, which sometimes will create further respiratory distress. And then in terms of what we are evaluating, we're really looking at our work of reading our respiratory rate and heart rate to see if the patient is responding to the therapy initially. You should see your saturation or your um, improve. Um, and if your saturation is not improving, maybe your FiO2 is being weaned. Um, so kind of doing that balance of your um, saturations and your FiO2 and uh, titrating. And it's not necessary always in a short term period to necessarily have a blood gas to titrate off, but this sometimes can be helpful for optimizing uh, patient management. So if you're patient, you initiate non-invasive, um, they have a really good response, your saturation has um, improved or your FiO2 needs have dropped, um, and they're looking much more comfortable on that, um, that may be enough of a a measure at that point um, to say that they are supported and continue that existing therapy until um, transferred to a tertiary center. Um, if you're unsure of how everything's going, then that might be the time where a blood gas or um, additional uh, measurement or uh, diagnostics might be helpful for um, how you guide your therapy after that. So once you have a patient on therapy and the therapy is ongoing or you're, it's your role to maintain therapy, whether until they're discontinued or until um, they're transferred out, um, there's a few things we think about for longer term non-invasive therapy. One is that we do routine and frequent skin assessments. So we would say that um, at least Q4H, they should be removed from the mask. Usually you have to suction them potentially for our smaller kids anyways. Um, and they have a quick break and a quick assessment of the skin. Um, so at least um, at a certain interval, they should have ongoing assessment and potentially barriers used um, for any skin uh, skin breakdown that's noticed. Um, but the one thing that I think is most important is just at least assessing that your mask is over tightened or any hard plastic bits are, are touching uh, the patient's face um, because that is a high risk for pressure injury. The second thing that we always think about for all pediatric patients that's um, pretty standard in our institution is that we have humidity for non-invasive. Um, so if it is a total face mask, um, we may set it to that a lower setting or whatnot, but if it's a nasal interface um, through uh, infant prongs or whatnot, we can set it to 37 degrees and provide optimal humidity for these patients on long-term non-invasive. So this usually doesn't come up a lot, but it's important to address that adolescents are sometimes pediatric patients as well. And really for these type of patients, we would recommend that the approaches used in this population become more similar to adults. Um, so we would probably use a full face mask, a single limb system, um, 
and do bi-level support to a support, support acute non-invasive. So in summary, use the equipment that you'll be familiar with and learn the equipment that you'll be, be using in pediatrics. Um, don't be surprised if you encounter challenges with mask fit, leak or synchrony on bi-level supports and achieving compliance for that kind of younger age ranges in pediatrics. This is something we encounter every day when trying to provide non-invasive support. Um, and so it's just important to acknowledge them and try to do our best in terms of overcoming them. And then in terms of options and therapies, we use both bi-level and CPAP and we titrate to your respiratory assessment, which is usually work of breathing respiratory rate and saturation. So in closing, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to watch this and thank you for making uh, the time to improve your knowledge and expertise in terms of pediatric non-invasive ventilation. Um, I'd remind you that you've always made it through 100% of your worst days at work, even in those most stressful situations in terms of managing patients. Uh, it's important that we have the opportunities to talk about um, case management as well as um, manage um, uh, our expectations and our feelings about how these cases go, um, always in an effort to optimize them and make sure that uh, we do well with these patient situations as well. So with that, I will say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you come back to this as a resource in the future.